So moving into the next topic, uh, which is package management, this is going to be a little bit more high level than uh, profilers, which is or profilers and debuggers, which is already pretty high level because it's really language specific. But a lot of the ideas behind package management are common across languages and tools. So we'll talk more about the ideas here. So a software usually builds on other software, right? Like any program we write is using language libraries and probably a bunch of other packages. Um, and so that means you need to manage these dependencies somehow. Um, so a couple things that are involved. Um, you have package repositories. When people write programs, or uh, when people write libraries, uh, they need to put them somewhere in order to make it so that other people can access them. And so different languages and different build tools you'll use well, different websites for this sort of thing. For example, for Python packages, the place where most people put them is in the Python package index, which is at pypy.org. Or for um, Rust crates, uh, they go on crates.io, and so on. So it's all very language specific. But in general, uh, the community is usually uh, agreed on some place to put all the libraries that are written for a certain language, and so they can be found in a single place. Um, and so what these, uh, what these uh, websites do is they store basically uh, source code and then often pre-compiled binaries for a bunch of different platforms for every version of a package. So if someone writes some software and for every version of that software this will host the source code along with some binaries. Now software evolves over time and we need some way to refer to different pieces of software, right? So like how can we do that? Well, maybe we can just give a sequential number to each piece of software. Like as the program evolves, um, we say, okay, this is version one, version two, version three, version four, and so on. But uh, that's kind of clunky, and we can do a lot better than that in terms of communicating meaningful information. Maybe one thing we could do is refer to different versions of a library by like their git commit hash. We had the version control lecture last time, right? So every time something makes a change in version control and commits it, it'll be associated with some commit hash. But that's also not a very informative thing. Like, Audible will tell you is like, exactly which code it corresponds to, but it's not really interpretable to a human. Um, so people come with better ways of reading software. And there are a couple of different approaches, but I think what most people are standardizing on these days is something called semantic versioning. So, uh, do you have that in chunk? It's in the box. Oh. And so semantic versioning is something like this, like you might see version numbers like 1.2.4, and then the way you're supposed to interpret version numbers like this is that this is a major version, this is a minor version, and this is a patch version. And then the way this is supposed to be interpreted is that, okay, like you're writing software, and then when you actually change these version numbers, well, if you fix a bug, and it doesn't really change the behavior of anything else. Then you increment this thing, so like you'll end up with 1.2.5. It has all the same functionality as the earlier version, but you fixed a bug. And any software that works with this version of the library should also work with this version of the library, because all you've done is fixed a bug. Um, when you increment the, the minor version, well, you're supposed to do that whenever you introduce a new feature in a way that's backwards compatible. So like you add a new function to the library without affecting any of the other um, functions in the library, well then you might release 1.3.0. And when you uh, increment the major version, you only do that when you introduce backwards incompatible changes. So like any software that originally worked with this won't work with version 2.0.0 anymore, or is not guaranteed to work with this new version anymore. And so now these version numbers are actually super useful, right? Like if I write a program and I want to specify which version of the library it will work with, if I give a semantic version number, then it should work with anything that has the same major version number, at least the specified minor version number, and then any patch version number. Does that make sense? And you can see how this is more useful than just having sequential version numbers or something like that. Um, So we can see, for example, uh, or let, let's just make sure we understand what exactly this means. If I say that a software uh, package depends on at least version 1.2 of some software, then like, that means that 
I can run this on top of anything where this is exactly the version I'm looking for. And this can be anything equal to this or greater, because like the minor version number is only increased when new functionality is added that doesn't affect backwards compatibility. It can't break any software that relies on anything in, in the older version of the software. And also, I can rely on any patch version because that's only incremented when bugs are fixed. And so it shouldn't matter when bugs are fixed. My library that builds on top of this should still behave in the same way. So that's version numbers. Um, and then one thing you can do in addition to specifying version numbers, and I might have some dependence, uh, I might be writing some software that has a couple dependencies. Say I'm depending on package A, version 1.2 or greater. Um, let me use this notation to say, okay, I'm depending on package A and I need at least version 1.2, because like maybe I'm using some new feature that was in 1.2 that was not in 1.1, but also I don't want version 2.0 because like that could be backwards and compatible. And like say I need uh, dependency B, that's some other version number. And here, maybe I might even specify a patch version, like, okay, I want 3.5.4, because like some critical bug was fixed here, and I don't want to be running on some older version, but I also, I, I don't want to be running on 4.0, so I have that requirement, and so on. I might have some requirements in terms of the different dependencies and what versions I want. So like, as we talked about, version numbers are super nice, but maybe something I can do in addition uh, is specify exactly which software I want to be running. And this is nice for making the whole process kind of really reproducible. Um, and more reliable. So if, if I really say my software is called X and it relies on these versions of A and B, if I just gave somebody my software X and told them like these are my requirements and then they went ahead and installed things that kind of satisfied these uh, conditions I gave but were a little bit different than what I did. Like say I installed, uh, this is what I did. Say I installed like version 1.3 of this and version 3.4 of this, but then let's say I was running my software and he installed one, version 1 1.4 of this in version 3. Point, oh, this doesn't work. Version 3.5.6 of this. Like in theory, if everybody does semantic versioning correctly and follows the whole like increment patch version when you fix bugs, and increment minor version number when you add new features, but increment major version number every time you introduce any backwards incompatible change, well then everything should work out. But sometimes people make mistakes and like accidentally introduce new bugs in uh, later versions of software, things like that. So maybe in addition to specifying just my constraints, I could specify exactly which versions of dependencies I want to install. Like maybe I might specify my constraints, but I might also say, like make sure you install exactly version 1.3 of A, and make sure you install exactly version 3.6 of B. So I won't have a situation where like, say I install some software and it works, but then Jose goes and installs the same thing, and he has different behavior. And then in addition to this, you can do one other thing. Uh, you can actually give a cryptographic hash of the contents of the dependency. So this is kind of like the git uh, commit hash. It's kind of equivalent to that, um, in addition to all of this. And that gives you an additional benefit that you don't need to trust the package repository anymore. Like, your tool will check, okay, like, B has commit hash something, and A has commit hash something, and when you go and actually fetch the dependencies from online, from PyPy or wherever else, and you actually check that the contents match what you're expecting, well then you can be really sure that nothing was tampered with, right? Otherwise, say a malicious package repository could be like, okay, I go and install my packages and everything works fine, but then when Jose goes and installs my software, it, is, it, gives, me it gives them different versions of these dependencies that actually have some kind of malware or something in it. So by giving cryptographic hashes, you enforce that Whoever installs your software along with dependencies gets exactly what you installed as well. So that, that's a concept uh, usually called lock files. So lockdown dependencies. Also outside of lock files, like you may see that when you're downloading like some Linux I like ISO, like with like a, a disk image, they provide you like an MD5. That means like if you get that thing, you can like, run a hash. Like check that like that works out, and as long as no one is kind of tampering with the main repository, then it's, you can get it from anywhere and just check that the hash is the same. Yeah. 
Any questions about cryptographic hashes, or have you guys heard of that before, or should we give a quick summary of those? Uh, raise your hand if you have heard of cryptographic hashes. So any questions? Any questions about lock files? Yeah. Can you explain what they are and how you can set them up? Oh, so again, this is all very language and tool specific. Um, but basically, a lot of language uh, tools will just do this by default, so you don't need to worry about it. And I think all the ones that support this will do it by default, and the ones that don't support it, well, they don't support it, so you can't really do anything about it. Um, yeah, so yeah, it's language specific. But usually, it'll go, it'd be in the form of like, you have one file which will describe these kinds of constraints, and then you'll end up with another file, maybe called like something.lock, and it'll have the actual hashes or specific version numbers or things like that. And you'll keep both of these, both the kind of high level descriptions of the dependencies and the lock file contents under version control for your own project. Any more questions about lock files? Yeah. This will all seem a little bit abstract, but again, uh, it's all very language specific. So if you understand the concepts, then you can apply them to any particular language. So the next thing I want to talk about is how you specify version numbers. Through software X might depend on a couple different packages. How should you specify which version of the package you need? You can do a couple, you can imagine doing a couple different things. Maybe you could uh, give constraints like I did here. Like, okay, I need at least 1.2, because I'm relying on a feature that was in the 0.2 minor release of major version one. And also, of course, I don't want to go to the next major version number because it might be breaking backwards compatibility. Like similar thing with this one, except I have the additional thing that I'm specifying the patch version. There's like, oh, some really important bug was fixed and my software doesn't work with older versions of this because that bug messes it up. Um, but if both of these are given in terms of constraints, you could imagine, so here it's like I'm specifying minor version, here I'm specifying the um, minimum minor version number, here I'm specifying like a minimum patch version. Maybe I can also imagine giving constraints in terms of like, I want exactly version 1.4.3 of this software. And there are different trade-offs in terms of specifying these constraints in different ways. So giving these constraints in terms of kind of like, I want at least this version number is good in terms of letting the developer of these libraries fix bugs and then those kind of will automatically be used by anybody who installs my software later, right? So I released my package X and it uses version 1.2 of library A, and then oh, someone discovers a bug in version 1.2 and that's fixed in version 1.2.1. Well, 1.2.1 still satisfies this constraint, and whatever tool I'm using to install dependencies should hopefully install the latest version of the software that satisfies the constraint. And so like updates uh, and bug fixes should propagate automatically if I do this style of thing. But there are also benefits to specifying exact version numbers, because maybe my software relies on specific quirks, maybe it relies on a specific bug that was in an earlier version of the library, or maybe I just don't trust the developer to follow semantic versioning, like maybe I'm just thinking, oh, they might mess up and break my software accidentally, and so for that reason, it might be good to specify exact version numbers. And so there's just some trade-offs there, and you need to think when you're releasing a library or releasing some software, which is right for you. I think there's no single right answer, but this is something you uh, need to think about. People try really hard to follow semantic versioning and it often doesn't work out in slight corner cases and so that's something you need to be aware of. So any questions about how you specify version numbers? Like these general ideas will be present in most tools you use where you can specify things like what minimum version number you want or whether you want an exact version of something or things like that. The syntax will be different for different uh, languages but the ideas will all be the same. So the next thing I want to talk about is how you actually go from things like these constraints to, I say like, okay, I want to install software X, it has these dependencies, go fetch these dependencies. Like, how is that actually done? Well, so package managers use different dependency resolution algorithms to look at these requirements and then figure out how to satisfy them. And it can actually get really complicated. And I think for a certain class, like if you allow pretty sophisticated ways of specifying dependencies, you can actually make this problem computationally hard. Uh, which is kind of neat. But this is again just something to be aware of. 
Because you can end up in really complicated situations, right? Like I can have package A and B and C, but suppose like if I look at the dependencies for package B, like B might actually depend on C. So here's like dependencies for X. And here are the dependencies for B. And say B depends on package C, and it has this constraint that this needs to be at least version 1.5 and less than 2.0. Now I have a problem, right? If I want to install X, X needs specific versions of A and B, and then needs this exact version of C, but like the possible allowed versions that B needs of C is not compatible with this, right? So things can get pretty complicated. Um, and especially if you're doing things like installing software system-wide, which you might do if you have uh, programs that use dynamically loaded libraries, you can end up in situations where you want different programs that want incompatible versions of libraries, and it can get really complicated. Um, and so, again, here's a kind of situation where there isn't really a solution to it in all cases. It's more of a, this is something you need to be aware of, that this kind of issue can exist. And here's maybe another reason to be kind of careful in specifying your own dependencies so you don't end up in situations where you can get stuck. Like you want to be as expressive and like clear as possible when saying like, okay, this is the true requirements. I don't want to say something more strict than I need to because it might cause problems somewhere else. And I'm trying to figure out how to satisfy my whole dependency graph. Um, and yeah, if you're curious, you can even look at the source code for how some of these tools handle their dependency resolution. Some tools take really simple approach, like they'll just go, you want to install X, like let me look at the requirements one at a time, and for each one, I'll just install the latest version of the software that satisfies the constraints. And then when I try to recursively satisfy dependencies, well, I'll just install the latest version and so on. And if there are ever any incompatibilities, well, I'll just ignore it and pretend it works. But like, hope it works out. Um, other tools might do something more sophisticated, like it'll look at all the dependencies and try to find the versions that satisfy all the different constraints and then we'll report back to you if things don't work out, or things like that. Again, all very tool and programming language specific. But a pip, the Python package manager, for example, does not do anything particularly sophisticated here, while apt, which is one package manager for Linux, like installing system-wide programs, um, does something much more sophisticated here. We'll report errors to you, and even give you kind of an interactive prompt to say like, oh, here's the incompatibility, here are the choices you can make to try to resolve. Any questions about the idea of dependency resolution in these uh, tools? Okay, um, so the next thing I wanna talk about is something called virtual environments. So say you're developing multiple different software projects, like I'm writing software project X, but I'm also working on some project Y that might have some different and maybe overlapping set of dependencies. And uh, Maybe the dependencies, the versions aren't exactly the same. Like, say I'm developing software Y. Um, I'm going to use the same format I used over there. So here's dependencies for Y. And say this depends on uh, library A. But here I need something that's like version 1.3 or later. Well, this is kind of fine if I'm working on both X and Y at the same time, even if I install all these libraries kind of system-wide, right? Because I could install version 1.3 or later of A, and that's still compatible with the set of dependencies for X. But this can get really crazy really quickly, right? Like now suppose I want uh, to use library B in project Y as well. But maybe here I need some older version of B. So maybe I need version 2.0 of B, right? Now this is a problem. There's no set of versions of like A, B, and C that I can install to work on both projects X and Y. Um, for A, it works out, but for, uh, for library B, like I need some version 2.X for project Y, and I need some version uh, 3.X for project X, right? So like maybe I install this version when I want to work on Y, and then I go and install a different version when I want, whenever I want to work on X and like keep switching versions, right? That can get really annoying. Um, and so there's a better solution for that. And uh, one solution is something called virtual environments. Uh, and the idea is that instead of installing these libraries kind of system-wide, you install libraries in a way that are specific to each particular project. 
Uh, and I can give a quick demonstration of that in the context of virtual lang, which is a tool for doing this for Python. Um, we do a lot of Python demonstrations, but I think the undergrad classes here use a lot of Python, so I think it's pretty useful. Um, so I won't do a very complicated demonstration, but I'll just show you a simple thing. Um, so there's this library called NumPy, and uh, I've installed it system-wide on my machine. So if I just open up Python, and look at what version of NumPy I'm using. Okay, like this is version 1.15.4. Um, well, one thing I can do is create a virtual environment, and what this does is, okay, I say like, I have this folder N, I can give it any name I want. Um, and I'm going to install dependencies oops, for uh, a, whatever program I'm working on in this folder N. And so it's gonna be separate from my system-wide dependencies. And don't worry about the specific commands I'm using uh, for Python here, you can look them up later. There's a link in our uh, notes for this section. Um, but I can go ahead and do like pip install numpy inside this virtual environment. Um, and I can even install a, a newer version inside this virtual environment. Like inside here, I'm running version 1.16.0 of NumPy, whereas for my system-wide install of NumPy, I'm running version 1.15.4. And so this just shows how I can easily have different sets of dependencies for different projects. I can have a system-wide install, and I can have as many virtual environments as I want, and just activate one or the other to kind of swap in a whole different set of dependencies that will be loaded whenever I uh, run my code. And so there, like, this is the virtual env is a particular software that's used for Python programs. There's even other alternatives to virtual env for Python, and then for different languages, like say for Ruby, there's a tool called Bundler, and so on. So you'll need to look up for whichever language you're using, what the particular tool. But this is the general idea, that you uh, maintain separate sets of dependencies per project. Um, some other languages don't really have this problem. Like say Rust, for example, what it'll do by default is compile a static binary. So when you're building a program, it'll pull in all the dependencies and just make one fat binary that contains kind of like inlined or like stuck into the binary uh, all, of, um, all the code from the dependencies. And so if you're working on two different projects, well, there's no kind of like system-wide install or shared libraries or shared anything between the programs. So you don't really need to worry about this issue. So it's not an issue in the context of certain languages. Any questions about this idea of virtual environments. Okay, and then the, the last thing we're gonna talk about is something called vendoring. So this is a very different approach to dependency management, but uh, one thing you can do rather than bothering with all this complicated stuff is if you're working on a software project and you need to use another library, just take all the source code for that li library and copy and paste it into your project. And so you just have one gigantic tree containing all your code and all the other people's code, and just kind of build everything at once and don't really worry about dependencies in the traditional sense. Um, and so the, there are some advantages to doing this. Like you're not depending on package repositories anymore. You're not relying on dependency resolution anymore. If you compile your code, it's like always the same code every time. Uh, and uh, so you know like exactly what you're building against. And certain people do this. Like for example, Google, I think, maintains one gigantic repository and it has all their code. And they've also vendored all the code that they're using from other people because they don't want to be relying on package repositories. They don't want to be worrying about like, oh, author of library A accidentally broke something in a patch version and now they have to deal with it. And so vendoring is a pretty good approach in some ways and so it might be something you want to think about if you're working on a software project. It's a very different approach to dependency management. Um, yeah, and so that is all we have for package management, all the high level ideas we think you need to know. And then of course, to actually make use of any of this stuff, you need to look at the documentation for the particular tool you're using for the particular language. But that should be easy once you understand this thing. So any questions? Okay, so let's take a 10 minute break, and then after that we will talk about OS customization followed by remote machines covering topics like SSH and SSHFS and so on. <laughs>